All right. So very good. And um, so I'll be covering the pre nutrition requirement and, uh, and a few practical things about colostrum management. And I have done a few troubleshooting and then I, we will cover a few things here and then I will do a little bit of highlighting and emphasizing because we, we do get quite a few questions regarding colostrum volume. Right, and um, primarily in the winter, but also, you know, in other, in other, uh, in other seasons, you know, uh, during the year. So, you know, when it comes to the replacement heifer, you know, replacement heifer program, that and include also, you know, the bull calf. And um, so today we will only, you know, I will cover just the prepartum and the maternity. We will not cover, uh, you know, all the remaining. So we will do a different webinar for this because of the content. So just to make sure we have enough, uh, enough time to cover some of the key components. And I will do emphasize quite a bit on, on how we feed our prepartum cows, right? From dry off all the way up to, you know, to the maternity and including the maternity, right? So, and uh, these are just, you know, the, the new NRCs has been released and uh, these are just guidelines and, and there are, you know, differences in, in how we, we feed our cows. So there is not just one single, you know, recommendation because it all depends on digestibility and the quality, especially the quality of the, the forages, right? And uh, starch and protein and a number of things. And then we come up within the ranges that the NRC provide you know, with our best, you know, combination. Most of these recommendations here or, 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 or guidelines are based on a, on a cow, on a Holstein cow that has about 740 kilos, or about roughly, you know, uh, 15, 1600 pounds. And uh, so, but in general, you, you see, you know, the energy and the protein for the dry cows and, and, and especially for the close up to a cow. So this is very important, especially in the dry cows, as one mentioned and the close up cow, we have about 50% of the total feed oil growth, right? And in the close up cow, especially the last three or four weeks prior to Calvin is where we are gonna have, you know, the synthesis, you know, putting together the colostrum for, for the cow. So it is very important. And uh, I did mention a few things regarding energy. I think has been a, a few, you know, update on, on, on how much energy we feed to the cows and all the units are in, in, in the metric systems. And um, especially vitamins, some of the minerals and trace minerals, there is an emphasis on fatty acid and protective methionine that has a positive effect in, in colostrum, magnesium, phosphorus, and, and of course calcium. And um, here I did mention about the DECA diet because a number of farms do use as a way to prevent hypocalcemia um, a DCAD, so that to induce a controlled metabolic acidosis in cow. Some other we start seeing now that use the binder and uh, to, you know, chelate, you know, calcium. And uh, it's in, in, my, in my personal experience, it's, it's not only, it's not specific for, for calcium, it also, you know, can chelate other like, like magnesium. So I, I think it is important that you think about it, how the interaction between the nutrition management and the vaccination program and your prevention of hypocalcemia. The, the, these three interactions, I think, are extremely important when it comes to calcium, right? And I'll mention the interaction between the vaccine and the DECA diet. Uh, the DECA diet, we know there are effectives, but there are some things that we need to adjust, and especially not with the DECA, but adjusting how we do our vaccination program. There, there are some interactions that are I'll cover it in, in a few minutes. But here is just an overview based on dry matter intake for these uh, two groups of cows. So when, you know, there are differences here, but when I, you know, in my practical experience, when they do, you know, use an ionic diet for the prepartum cows to prevent hypocalcemia, you know, and um, I, I have some, you know, positive effect when they go a little higher than 1%. In, in dry matter intake, you know, with calcium. So to feed a little bit, you know, more calcium uh, to the cows, I think it is, uh, the, the cow usually, you know, respond well, and uh, we tend to feed less, you know, an ionic diet to, to get the same urine pH. So with that, I'm gonna jump now to the maternity, and, uh, and I try to elaborate a little bit how, you know, we manage. And, and there are different systems on how, we manage our transition cows. And uh, the, so, so what this means is there are more than one approach 
to get it right, right? So there is no a, a, a one type of facility that will, you know, be better than than the other. So there are some depending on 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 the location in the country, depending on the weather, and uh, and uh, so when when we go to more the semi you know arid areas, you you see some of these dry lot. And um, and this is where the cows stay there, the preparted cows, they go through labor there. Some do have a specific area and uh, where the cows go and labor, but most of the cows will go through and labor there. And then from there, they move to the maternity. We have these group maternities and um, especially for uh, large facilities and, and free stall systems. And uh, so sun bedded and, uh, and, and then there could be two, three or four cows there in these uh, big pens and uh, they tend to work really, really well. I, I really like, you know, the cows are, you know, uh, let alone as a group there, especially for heifers. They, they like to be in, 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 in groups, especially in, in, in my practical experience, they, they are a little bit more quieter and it really does help, you know, to handle, you know, when they had to collect the first, you know, milking, especially collecting the calostrum. Some other free stall system, they have these individual Calvin boxes, so Calvin pen. The cows just come there in this one, and in this one they come when they, you know, showing, you know, showing feet or, or with the water bag. They just move there just for the labor portion, right? And um, and it's just to represent the prepartum pen in 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 our free uh, free stall system. So what the these arrows show is just you know how frequent we move cows, and I think this is absolutely important for the milk letdown process. And, and and this also highlight how important it is to adjust the training. You know when we work with this system based on how they set up the maternity. Right, so most cows are gonna be moved right in time, like this cow is just getting close to labor and uh, she will be moved to the calving box, right? One move and uh, it goes to the maternity and the maternity usually the cow stay for about an hour and, uh, and then they start collecting calostrum, right? Or some other cows, they can go to the parlor, right? They go to the parlor and they, you know, collect calostrum. And, and here every farm is different. So there is some distance. So the cow has to walk you know, to the power. And I notice in the practice, you know, how the distance really matter for the cow, right? Especially when collecting volume of calostrum, right? And, um, and then one of the reasons is because when the cow releases oxytocin and then we stimulate them, that is good for about 10 minutes, right? And, uh, and as Juan mentioned, most of the, you know, colostrum or milk is in the alveoli. So in the, in the, in the you know, inside the mammary, the gland. So, and uh, this, this is very important how, how we collect the first milk in, in the colostrum. And then once we are done with the first milking, and then some farms they do the second milking because they still, you know, use that milk to feed, you know, replacement heifers and bull calf. And then finally the cow has been moved to the fresh pen. So at least, at least the cow has been moved three times, right? And uh, twice before, you know, collecting uh, colostrum, right? And all this is just, you know, a team effort that keeps everything running. So with that in mind, I'm going to try to answer the first question. These are just, I have a number of questions that I receive over the years, and I try to come up with, you know, science-based, you know, uh, answers. One of the questions is, what, what is the appropriate timing for calostrum, you know, harvesting, right? And uh, this is an interesting study that I really like it, and uh, from Dr. Uh, quickly, and um, that it shows, right, that, you know, this is time after Calvin, right, uh, on the X uh, axis, and then the Y axis is the IgG, you know, concentration. And uh, you, you can see there, there is quite, quite a variation, but what it really means is, is, you know, there is a sweet spot where you can collect, you know, the right amount of volume, enough volume, and enough, you know, concentration of, you know, immunoglobulin. As time passed by after Calvin, let's say more than 12 hours after Calvin, you are going to start getting the dilution effect. So this is the dilution effect you start getting, you know, the same amount of uh, immunoglobulin, the mass of immunoglobulin, but you get much lower. So where is that appropriate? It's just within the first, you know, hour or eight hour, you know, after Calvin. I think this is important uh, when we want to collect, you know, quantity and quality of uh, calostrum. Right. So for most farms that 
they do in one way or other have a, a program to control leukosis or ionis, right? This is in a more and a less the process that I see. So once the cow go through the maternity, right, they are gonna process the cow and they have individual shoot or they have a, a or they go to the parlor, right? The colostrum is uh, collected there, and then they measure each cows get their own bricks, you know, refractometry there, and it has to go through the pasteurizer for, you know, a 60 cc. Everything is in, in metrics, and uh, and um, and uh, but we can convert uh, to Fahrenheit, and um, and they go a 60 cc for 60 minutes. Right, and then we store the colostrum. It could be in a refrigerator, you know, at four cc, or it can go to a freezer at minus twenty. Right, and after that, you know, we either use whatever we have in the refrigerator, or if we run out of that, we start using the frozen the frozen sample. And and there are different throwing, uh, um, you know, devices. Here here is just one device. What we you know throw that at forty cc for fifteen minutes. And, um, and once it thaw out, so we remove some of the container. In this example, it's just, you know, the nipple, but it could be the tube, right? Some farm use the tube. The most important here, there is a time, you know, temperature difference, right? These are 40 cc, and we try to let it cool for a bit, right? For a few minutes to, to you know, uh, what is the milk temperature to 38, uh, Celsius, and that is how we feed it to the cat. So this is in a more and less the process, right? You know, at the maternity, you know, uh, uh, to to you know feed you know quality colostrum in a timely manner to a newborn cat, right? So another question that is is important that Juan covered um, in his presentation is what are the colostrum components? And, and, and I kind of summarize this, you know, and, and because I think it is important, especially when we are running out of calostrum, we don't have enough calostrum to understand the component. So the largest component is water, right? 76% is water. There are about 23, 24, depending on the study, 25% solid, right? And depending on the breed also, most of them are gonna be the protein, fat, lactose, Right? There is about 1% of minerals and vitamin, and there is other component that one mentioned there. Right? So this is important when we have to troubleshoot at the farm level. So water is a key component, right? Water is a key component. And I, I, as, uh, as one mentioned, to put together the, especially colostrum, the last three or the last three days or, or, or a week, the cow has to spend a significant amount of energy, especially glucose and calcium, you know, to transfer the IgG, you know, from blood into the mammary tissue. And, and you need the IgG for two reasons. You need the IgG to control diarrhea, right, and, and cat, but also you need the IgG because in most of our prepartum vaccination programs, we vaccinate for mastitis. So, so to get a real biological effect, you need the IgG inside the mammary gland. Right, and for both, for mastitis and to control calf diarrhea. And, uh, and that is it's, it's a process that takes a significant amount of energy. When you read the, you know, the NRCs, the, the, the current version, you know, the colostrum synthesis is not, is not included in all these equations. So I think we have to use our common sense here when we formulate diet for cows, that, that, that some cows might need a little bit more energy than what we actually would think about it. Right. So when it comes to feeding, you know, the colostrum to the cows, so there are kind of four, four key components. Quality is, is, is very important, as one mentioned, more than 50 milligrams by milliliter or 50 grams by liter. And uh, so but new studies, when you, you know, literature new, they, they are already, you know, working with 70 grams uh, by liter, right? Quantity is based on a percentage of body weight, so that depends on how big our newborn calf are. Are we using Holstein cow crosses with beef, or are we using you know jerseys? You know, a significant difference. So there might be a twenty pound difference or more, or thirty pound difference, right? About ten kilos or fifteen kilos, right? So for this example, 10, 12 percent of the calf body weight will be forty kilos. You need about four, four point eight you know, liters or kilos and two feedings. And, um, 
at least we need to feed, you know, four liters, and that will give that, you know, 100, 150 total gram of IgG in, in the cat. And I have as a rule that if you get more than nine liters, you know, right, when, when working with an employee, you know, especially in the maternity, they get a cow that give a lot of milk, right, a lot of colostrum in the first uh, uh, milking, especially more than nine liters, usually by default, I think they have less you know, IgG concentration, what I think, you know, if, if it is less than nine liters, it's probably 50. If it is more than nine, like 12, 14, you're usually diluted. So it might get less and we might have to adjust our, our feeding, uh, our feeding to the cat. You know, timing is important, right? Especially to get the feeding within the first two hours, timing and volume. I think there is a nice study in Canada showing how important is the volume because we, we tend to do just one bottle, right? Four, one gallon or four liters, all at you know, once because of simplicity, right? And, and, and the logistic of doing this at the farm level. And um, some farms, what I like it is they would do eight or 10% within the first two hours, right? And they will do another 4% six hours later, right? For, when I, I'm referring about 10% or 4%, I'm talking about percent of the calf body weight, right? They do have an estimation on the weight scale. And, uh, and, and not all farms can weight, you know, their calf, but the, the number of farms do weight. And uh, so they do know you know, this information. So cleaning and sanitation is important, especially for bacterial load, because both, you know, it do have an effect on um, calf, uh, calf uh, mortality, and, and also it has an effect in the absorption of IgG to the calf. And in general, you know, we know that absorption of IgG will drop about 4% for every hour after, you know, birth. So let's say in 12 hours, you know, you have 50% less absorption of the you know, IgG that we are feeding. So quantity, timing, and quality are very important to get, you know, to get the calf on a, on a good start. And uh, when it comes to the monitoring <clears throat> and uh, the program, the, especially the colostrum program, you know, the BRICS is, is today is, I would say, fairly simple to do it. And then in most farms, we see these digital, you know, devices and uh, that it can monitor you know, the IgG in colostrum, and also they can collect blood sample, not for all, but just in a, in a group of a calf, perhaps once a week. Some farms, very few that I know do on, on every single calf, but some of the other is like, they do have the process establishes, and now they can, what they call with this monitoring program, this is just the quality control. They want to see how calf are responding to our colostrum management, and they might take 10, 15, depending on the size, or on a weekly basis, between two and three days, they start getting the blood sample, get the genome, measure the bricks, and they are looking for this, you know, benchmark, right? And uh, so if they get greater uh, or 8.4 or greater, that means that they have enough, you know, IgG in, in zero. So the colostrum is still working. Some of these devices are very sensitive to the read right, environment temperature, so both the sample and the instrument has to be at the environment temperature because you can have false reading, right, quite a lot, and, and especially in the winter, right, when, when colostrum is sitting there, it can get really cold and you can go to get a really false reading, so higher break than what actually they are, especially when measuring colostrum samples, right. Another thing that I really like it is, you know, to monitor the cleaning and the sanitation. There are great devices available in the market. Here is one that I personally really like it. These are the System Sure Plus, right? Basically what they are is an ATP swaps. So what they do is they measure, you know, the ATP and the mitochondria of the bacteria. You just swab a surface, right? And you uh, insert the swab inside this machine and then you do a reading. And they will do the reading light unit, right? And uh, the machine already come calibrated because it's been used uh, uh, often in the food industry, right, for humans. And uh, so if the reading is greater than 30 in, in units, the reading light unit, you know, on using this system, the surface is considered dirty. And the way we use this one, you, you can use it in any surface, but we just come up with this in the pasteurizer, especially the valve when the colostrum come out. So we go inside and measure that when after the cleaning cycle, 
right? Or we use the bucket, the tube, or the bottles, whatever you use, and we want them to be less than five, five units of that. You know, reading less than 10 is considered clean, right? But that has been, I, I would say, outstanding to control, especially to control the cleaning process, the cleaning and sanitation process at, at the farm level. Right. So the next question is, is it possible to achieve 2% or less than 2% stillbirth? Stillbirth, the way we define stillbirth is these are normal gestation length, right? And I'll go in a minute about that. These are any calf that is either born dead, normal gestation, or die within the first 24 hours. Right? So is it possible to get less than 2%? The answer is yes, but we have a number of farms, especially the best farms that are now ranking about one to 2% stillbirth. And, and, and the reason why I say this, we, we, this is the phenotype. So we go to this farm and we actually see it, right? When we look at the overall stillbirth in the US, right, for the 9.4 million cow, it's about 5.1%, the overall stillbirth, right? From the latest, you know, USDA survey, right? But the top, but the top best, you know, 10% of the USDA here are achieving less than 2%, right? So here is an example. I just bring one from one of the large farms that has about um, uh, seven or 8,000 cows. So these are just two and a half months of uh, Calvin, right? And that's from January to March. And, and you can see, you know, that they are, you know, they have 1.33%, you know, a, a, a stillbirth. And, and, and I'm gonna make a, you know, a remark here because some of these are crosses cows or jerseys and hosting, and they use limousine boots, right? You can see that they still use uh, quite a bit of sex semen, and you can see here. So especially for the replacement heifers and every seen else go with, you know, beef boots. Yes, the question we do, get this one and we do monitor some of these. And, uh, and we also monitor on a calendar week from Monday to Friday. And also we monitor according to gestation length, right? And I go in a minute, especially because you will have more dead calf in short gestation length and long gestation length, right? These are about the short gestation length is about 10%. You know, you have a bulk that is the average, on, 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 on cows. And then you have a group of cows, about seven, eight percent more cows that are the long gestation. And then you have also a little bit more uh, higher mortality there, right? And there could be a number of reasons why the cow could have short or, or long gestation uh, length. Heat stress is one. The cow with heat stress will do have a tendency to have, especially heat abatement is, um, is, is not working well, you're gonna have a number of cows with George gestation rate, right? And that impact the maternity, right? And it has an impact also in colostrum quality and quantity, right? So here is again data from the US. We know that we have, you know, for pre wing calf, the morbidity, you know, it's about 34%. And mortality is about 5%. And this is just the average for the country within the first 60 days of life, right? And um, so here are just factors that are associated with morbidity, right? The most important at the calf level, IgG level, cold weather, or housing ventilation. <clears throat> and they, they, these are with mortality. Some of them are similar, right? And, uh, but all of them have something important that is, you know, the, the colostrum. So colostrum feeding is, is, is a key component, right? And we know, according to the latest development or the, what we call the consensus, right, on, on, on calf development, and uh, especially when, when looking at, you know, bricks, right? Or they, these are the total zero, you know, um, uh, uh, proteins measured by, by bricks here, right? So you can see that, you know, you have about 70%, 70% of the calf are either good or excellent ranking, right? You have a still a number of fair and poor. When I look at these farms that has 1% or 2% is still where we have 90%, right? 90% of them are in this good and excellent category, right? They have this much you know, zero protein, you know, grams by deciliter in blood. So that I would say that is, you know, a number of 
farm has made a significant pro uh, progress in, in improving you know, the maternity and especially how we harvest calostrum, how we clean everything, sanitation, and how we are feeding you know, calostrum to baby calf, right? So what is expected calostrum yield at first milking? This is another common question that I receive and, um, and often, you know, with, in, in, in a number of farms, whether they have Holstein or jerseys, right? So here is what I put, you know, for heifers or, or what is going to become the lactation one or for multiparo cows. So I give the average based on what the literature we have and what we are collecting on, on farms and, uh, and also the range. You know, some cows do go zero, so there is no calostrum and some go to 10. And this is first milking, right? So same is uh, for jerseys. Something important to know is when the cow goes through labor, the day before, three days or, or a week before, she will put together most of the calostrum there. So it's a major draw. It's a major draw from nutrient from the cow. So 10 kilos of calostrum will require about 14 megacal. I think about this. I give you the nutritional kind of guidelines in the first slide. This is worth like one day dry matter intake for the cow in terms of energy, it's, it's a significant draw. It's 14 megacal of energy, 1.35 kilo of protein, 21 gram of calcium. This is, this is a massive quantity for, for, for a cow. 100,000 international union of vitamin A, you know, 135 international union of vitamin E. It, it's a massive transfer. And, and that is important because of the calf. This will do have an impact on, on, on the calf. So let's say that you have a calf of 40 kilos or 88 pounds. So that requires about 4 to 4.8 kilo of calostrum, right? And, and, and they will get on average, you know, this type of, you know, calostrum. Your jersey is a lot smaller. So you have a significant, you know, uh, there is a significant different birth weight there. But it's still, it requires about 3 kilos, you know, 3.4 3 uh, kilos. And, uh, and jersey, you know, recognize has a little bit more solid, of what, you know, the total, sorry, of what hosting cow has. And, but this is an important question, especially when we had to troubleshoot and start, you know, do we have a volume problem? Are cows not producing enough volume? But we need to know, you know, what is expected from these uh, cows, right? So this is just to share uh, with you what is the effect of extending calostrum period. Why I'm sharing this is because I'm seeing I'm seeing a few farms that are doing this, and I see a positive effect. And I'm really pleased to see that you know the group in in, in Canada has done quite a bit of research on this, right? And uh, the traditional approach is we do first feeding first, or you know feeding in twice, but we do the feeding of calostrum, and then the calf goes with milk. Right, milk, milk replacer, whatever the program the farm is using. This, this is the traditional approach that we use in many farms. But what I see is that some are using something like this, right? They, they, there is an economic cost, right? There is about 20 to $24 more per calf, you know, total calf. So there is an economic implication. But what I've seen it, not only in research, but at the phenotype and practical, you know, at the farm level, a significant positive effect in calf health, right? So they will do the same volume of calostrum for the first feeding. They will use about 50% for the next two or three days, right? 50% milk, what is the transition milk, right? And after the day three or day two, depending on the farm, some farm use only two days, right? They will use 90% milk and then 10% calostrum. So this is what mimicking in a way what is for a natural calf to start drinking this transition milk, right? And how important it is. So what is the biological implication of this? You get more IgG transfer. There is any positive effect in the intestinal development, a significant drop in morbidity, right? And morbidity and average daily you know, gain or body weight gain are, are, are associated. So the, the implication for the calf is they gain more weight. Right, so each farm, because each farm has different cost of production, will have to do the calculation and see if the traditional approach of this, you know, transition milking calostrum, you know, transition meaning from full calostrum to full milk, is 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 a better approach, especially for the first two weeks. 
Remember that the colostrum, the second week is when we have most of the health problem, either pneumonia or diarrhea, right? So this is just to answer the question about, you know, what is the effect of extending the colostrum feeding? There is a positive effect, but also has an economic, you know, cost. And it's about 20, 20 to $24, depending on how, uh, how much we are feeding to, to the gut. So can I use colostrum replacer? The short answer is yes. You know, in the U.S., colostrum replacer are, you know, uh, regulated by the USDA, Center for Veterinary Biologics. And, and they had to show, you know, prove they actually raise, you know, or increase serum concentration or IgG above, above, you know, the 10 milligram by milliliter, right? So in a number of places I see is when they are, trying to, you know, work on controlling some of the, like yoni, leukosis, right? And uh, there are several products available in the market, right? But each farm, each veterinarian, and each, they should look for product that they do have research, you know, behind their claims, right? This is perhaps, I highlight that and I underscore that one because I think it is important. There are many but you, you gotta do the homework and find those, you know, products that they do have research behind their claim. And, and the most important is because you will need about 200 grams of IgG just for the for one calf to help ensure adequate passive transfer, right? So I'm gonna mention now a few uh, factors that are affecting colostrum yield, right? The, 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 we, we don't have enough volume. Why, why do I have enough volume? And I, I would say that this is, this is a common question that we get across, you know, during, you know, on a, on a calendar year. And, and, and then some of the question might come seasonal, like, you know, late in the fall or during the winter. But I do get in the spring and I do get this question also in the summer, right? So parity is something, you know, all these are, you know, the values are expressed in percentage, percentage of the average that I provide in one of the first, you know, slide. And uh, parity is one, so lactation one will produce about 22% less than the average multiple of cows. Season, fall and winter is about 20% less. And there is uh, some study says that, you know, the photo period, especially short daylight, uh, do have an effect on, like one mentioned, on melatonin. And, uh, and that has uh, um, an implication with prolactin, and prolactin can reduce milk or colostrum. And uh, I do have a personal practical assessment that I think winter, especially depending where the farm is, can have a significant drop, regardless of the photo period, Right, a significant drop in dry matter or water intake. And I think that is, is, is an area of what I, it is important to look, especially the first frost when we get into the winter. It has a significant drop in water intake and water intake will drop dry matter intake, right? Mastitis are dry off or calving, they reduce that they, they has, well, this is one of the biggest, right? It will reduce significantly colostrum, you know, quality and quantity. A short period, right, dry period, you know, especially cows that are less than 30 days, you know, and then this is associated sometimes with a short gestation length. Here we have the summer effect, the twins, you know, twin also has a, a, a short gestation length, right? And um, so it can drop about 20%. Timing of first milking, so if they milk right away, so the cow goes through parturition and right away they milk, yeah, they might get about, you know, a, a less colostrum if they wait, you know, they are in that sweet spot, you know, spot where it's about, you know, one or two to six hours or eight hours, right? When, when they melt there, they get more, more colostrum, right? But don't go too far because you start getting the dilution effect. And body condition of calving, especially the two extreme, and the most important what you might see that colostrum drop, especially with thin cows, like less than 2.75, right? It might drop a bit, you know, what colostrum volume is compared to the cows that are 3.2 or 3.5 on body weight. Calf birth weight has an implication. The bigger the calf, the more colostrum you get. Right, and here is something important because I mentioned about genetics, the, the effect of genetics. Calf birth weight is, is strongly correlated with genetic gestation length. The sire of the calf has a 
significant implication in gestation length. So the calf is what determines gestation length. And gestation length has a direct association with calf birth weight. So depending on what the bull is you're using on the farm, you might end up with bigger calf, which cause another problem that is usually, you know, if, if it, it gets too big, you cause dystocia. And if you get dystocia, you reduce, you know, calcium, uh, colostrum, right? And, um, but if the calvin goes as normal, you will get a, a little bit of more colostrum based on how big the calf is. Presence uh, of uh, newborn calf at Calvin, right? You know, right there with the cow. And there are studies that show there is no improvement, right? And there are studies we have done one where it shows that yes, there has uh, there is an implication, especially for first calf heifer, right? And uh, but this dosha, you know, difficult birth will definitely reduce, regardless whether or not you have the calf there. So pain, pain is negative, you know, for oxytocin release. And, uh, and definitely you will get, remember about the 80% of the colostrum on milk is in the alveoli, right? Aversive handler has a negative effect on colostrum uh, quality. And, and, um, and this is something that we always look when we had to troubleshoot how they are handling cows, right? Dry matter intake, especially think about this, when cows are losing weight prior to calving, right? It's always bad, it's bad for the cow, and it's bad also for the calf and it's bad for calostrum, right? Dry matter intake prepartum almost always determine how much the cow is gonna eat postpartum. But prepartum, what happened is you, you're gonna have a reduction of, you know, about 20% in calostrum volume, right? And the dry matter intake is think about energy, right? The cows are getting a lot less energy, higher MIFAS, so they get into this metabolic problem. And in the winter, you know, we know that water intake is affected because water is really cold, right? And, and, and cold water or wind chills, you know, really cold days with windy days, right? It will drop either both water intake and dry matter intake. And then you have your cows in negative energy balance that affect, that affect colostrum volume, right? Prepartum diet, just to feed the, you know, what we have, uh, um, in our NRCs, the new uh, revised version of the NRC, energy group protein, fiber, right, minerals, and vitamin. And then and that, that is a, a important. I made a comment regarding the diet, especially prepartum diet now in a few minutes. So um, in addition to the hosting, here is a study that was done, uh, Juan mentioned in Texas, right? And you can see in this study, this is a large Jersey farm, Right, and they, they, they follow the cows, you know, for two years, 2016 and 2017. You have here, this is June, right, all the way to April, right, for the two years. So, and I mark where winter is. Here is the combination of calostrum, you know, uh, uh, and, and the photo period, right? And here is the Calvin week, the same as, you know, think about this June to April. This is June all the way to April, right? And this is the THI, right? The THI, and, and both follow the pattern, right? And what they hypo, you know, one of the hypotheses in, in the study was that, uh, yeah, there is an effect in parity. You know, most of these heifers are uh, calving about 20 weeks of age in, in, host, in jerseys. So, you know, they are still growing. You know, the second parity, they still, still growing the heifers. Right, and they saw the biggest drop in the second lactation, second plus lactation, right? Either the cow's lactation two, three, or four or more, there's the biggest drop in colostrum volume, right? During the winter. This is just the percentage of cows that do not produce colostrum. So it could be about, depending on the month, you know, almost 40% of the cows do not produce, you know, any colostrum, right? So my alternative hypothesis hypothesis to this is, you know, and in, in the, where the study was conducted, you know, it's known for have very, very chill winter, right, and windy, or really low temperature that can have a significant impact, especially at the onset, the end of the fall, and during the winter can have a significant impact in dry matter intake. And I think this is maybe an additive effect, you know, regarding to the season effect, but anyway, parity in jerseys is the other way around. The whole thing can have lower colostrum. Uh, the season, there is an effect, and, and perhaps this is either 
water intake or rainwater intake, and there is a significant, this study also found a significant genetic effect. So what that means, there are specific family lines that are more prone to produce less calotin. So I think it is important when we are selecting the bulls that at least these are bulls that are positive for, you know, for, for, for milk. There is an association between milk and, and total protein, the PTA for, for proteins, right? So here is what I mentioned. I think it's the photo period. We don't know that. But it could be water, dry matter intake due to wind chill, right? This is, it could be any of the two or both together, right? It could get below zero, right? Especially in the winter, right? So for prepartum diet, you know, dry matter intake is absolutely important. Right, cows cannot be losing primary intake because that will trigger something increased NIFA prior to galvin and develop a number of metabolic problems. So when it comes to calostrum, we know that energy intake, there is a few studies that shows that, you know, it is important uh, the, the intake of the cow because remember, as Juan mentioned, this is an active process, requires calcium and energy. So vitamin D and daylight are both important right? Especially if daylights are important, the, the photo period is important to activate vitamin D, right? And vitamin D is important in calcium homeostasis, right? That requires PTH and, uh, and production of the 125 vitamin D, the active form of the vitamin D. So there is an enzyme and, uh, and also preparton is important. This We have to have enough magnesium in the rumen that activate the enzyme. Right, so to activate in some, and if we had too much phosphorus, right, and and we are feeding too much of the phosphorus, that inhibits the enzyme. So we can also have a problem, and we know that this, you know, vitamin D is also related to milk production, right? It could it could increase or decrease milk production. Vitamin E and, and selenium, they are also mentioned in a few studies, important for colostrum production. Right, and, uh, and the main effect of these two are not directly associated with colostrum pressure, but these are antioxidant, right? And they, these are very important, especially to prevent mastitis. And mastitis has a direct effect on, on, on colostrum volume, right? So something that I have also to troubleshoot has been more associated with, uh, in, the, in the upper Midwest, especially in the upper Midwest, and uh, we still feed, you know, in our prepartum cows, a significant amount of straw, right? And uh, we do have corn silage that has mycotoxin uh, issues, right? And, uh, but most of our straw, in, in a number of farms, the straw is stored outside, so open sky. You get snow, you get, you know, rain uh, on it. So you, you get the straw not, not in, in the best condition. So we have, you know, done a little bit of uh, troubleshooting on this. There is a number of studies that shows that, you know, if feeding like, for example, fescue or some type of ryegrass, and that ryegrass was contaminated with a, you know, with a fungus that especially produced the alkaloid, right? That will reduce prolactin. And if you don't have prolactin, you know, prior to calvin, it will have a significant effect. Right, and the volume of calostrum, right? Molds and mycotoxin, they have this effect. You know, they reduce the nutrient in feed, so because it affects the rumen activity, they cause inflammation and reduce the immunity, right? Especially prior to partum, the cows are immunocompetent. It reduce the right matter intake, right? And it also reduce milk yield and reproduction, right? So a number of farms, what we did have something like I show here in the picture, we changed for a straw that has been fed, you know, stored under the roof, and it has been unchanged the corsa, uh, corn silage or less, di, you know, a dilution effect in, in, in the corn silage, and we have improved a significant improvement in, in calostrum volume, not only for, for the maternity, but also for the cows, right? Postpartum cows. So positive animal um, interaction, right, is important because for productivity and welfare and an aversive handler or any stressor to the cow, so especially heifers that they go to the parlor for the third time has a negative effect. We do know by just in a few research studies have measured this that the cows do recognize an aversive handler so the, the level of stress goes up for the cows and that, you know, stress 
inhibit ox oxytocin and the mill leg down process, and we know how much. So it reduced about 1.5 to 2 kilos per day. So think about the, the impact and the calostrum. So this can be like 40% of the total calostrum, right? So this cow, you can see when we go to the maternity and we see cows like this, so the cow is already stimulated, right? They, they, they are just prepping, you know, getting ready to prep the cow and do all the sanitation before they attach the machine. Right. But this is important that the cows come to the parlor and are quiet and they are already stimulated before they, they collect the calostrum. Right. So this is something that I think is important when you have to travel shoot, you know, whether this is more related to nutrition, management, or how individuals are handling, you know, uh, uh, the maternity. There is an interaction between you know prepartum vaccination and anionic diet, right? And, and, and these can, depending how we do it, may have an implication on calostrum, right? And calostrum, especially calostrum quality. When you look at Holstein cows, think about, you know, Jersey cow has a little longer gestation. Think about a Jersey cow about five, six more day gestation length. Right, and the hosting cow has about 2.7, you know, 276, 279, right, plus minus six, now that, that is the mean. But the reality is when we do this uh, <clears throat> stillbirth analysis, what is considered normal, you know, we have a number of cows that do have short gestation, 256 to 269, the average is from 270 to 283, and then we have a number of cows with long gestation. The bulk of the cows are gonna be in the average, but you have about 10, 12%, 15% short, and then you have about 8% that has long gestation, right? So this is important to understand how we group cows and how we do our vaccination programs. And usually we group cows according to how we are feeding the anionic diet, right? And this is only for the anionic diet, and uh, because if the farmer using the binders may not have any, any of these uh, issues. But in general, on the farm is we vaccinate cows at dry off, and then we vaccinate cows 21 days prior to calving, right? So some farm here is just days prior to calving. So this is 28 and this is 21, right? So in this particular study, one of my students uh, did the, um, uh, and study on this to, to look at this interaction, right? And what we were proposing here is to, you know, vaccinate cows a week earlier, right? So these are they, you know, 249 will be 28 days prior to calving. So either 28 or 21. And we'll, you know, we assess the interaction, you know, you know, the metabolic, you know, uh, component, uh, effect that they have on, on the cow, including the quality of calostrum. So think about this. When we are grouping, we move cows every week, right? So when we move cows weekly to this group, so 50% of the cows, we have at least 21 days prior to cow. But the issue is the other 50%. The other 50%, especially because of the short gestation length, right? Cow will not be there 20 days. They will go in labor, you know, anywhere between seven to, to 18 days, right? So cows will do that and they do have an effect, right? They, the, our vaccination program do have an effect. And what the effect is, right? When you vaccinate cows, so usually we do two vaccines, one and this the booster administration. The booster administration is the most important to get higher IgG concentration, right? So, but this booster administration create an inflammation in the cow, an inflammation process. And that process lasts for about seven days, right, in the cow. So the inflammation is interacting with the effect of the DICA diet. The DICA diet is trying to stimulate the parathyroid gland to regulate the GI tract for to increase absorption of the of calcium, you know, prior to calving. But the vaccine, when we give the vaccine 21 days prior to calving, that inhibit the same receptor. So the parathyroid, you know, DICA is trying to stimulate, but the vaccine inhibit that. So what happened is, yeah, urine pH might be, you know, you know, in a metabolic acidosis, so the urine pH might be 6.2, but actually there is no any stimulatory effect in the parathyroid gland, 
right? So what we found is cows that were vaccinated on day 28 and then moved to the anionic diet on day 21 or vaccinated on day 28 and moved to the anionic diet on day 28. So we offered anionic diet seven more days. We have a significant positive effect in hypoglycemia. I reduce this as subclinical hypoglycemia by 46%. A, 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 a huge increase in glucose at Calvin, so there is more energy. And if you have more energy, then you have more, about 20% more IgG in colostrum. So I think this is very important to understand how we are, you know, adjusting our vaccination program according to our management, especially when we are trying to prevent hypoglycemia in cow. The reason is, like one mentioned, getting the IgG from the blood inside the mammary gland is an active process that requires significant amount of calcium and significant amount of glucose, right? And that there is an active, there is an interaction between the inflammatory reaction for the vaccine and the DECA diet, right? So as you get closer to Calvin, right, especially for example, if the farm forget to vaccinate the cows and they want to vaccinate the cows the following week, so that is counterproductive for the cows. And then it's better not to vaccinate a cow because the closer to Calvin you vaccinate, the lower the IgG concentration in the cow and the more metabolic problem for the cow, right? This is the last one. And this I think is in my practical experience working with farmer, you know, I, I, you know, I found this, I was able to measure, you know, some of the farms do have meter for water and we can see according to the temperature, right, on, on the farm, especially when you get below 12 cc, right, water intakes drop and dry matter intakes drop. We don't have individual dry matter intakes on the farm, but I can see that the variation, the coefficient of variation by looking at the average dry matter intake increase. So there is a number of cows, you know, water intake drop about 30%. Right, and that has a you know a negative effect in colostrum volume, right? And uh, and why is that? So most of the cows are losing weight, right? Losing weight prior to Calvin, right? Because it has a, you know especially in the prepartum pants, right? And um, and another areas that we look especially with some of the depending on on the water beans that they are using, you know where the cows are getting the water. Some of these they do have cover the top. So the cow has to push a ball, a plastic ball that is floating and they had to get the nose inside to get the water. So, and some of the heifers are not familiar with that. So they are not drinking water, especially in the maternity tissue. Water is a, is a critical component, 76% of the total, you know, calostrum. With that, I'm gonna stop here and take a few questions uh, you may have. Thank you.